Hello and welcome to Clock Tower Game Studios. Today we're going to be talking about how I'm painting my Daughters of the Burning Rose from Anvil Industries. Now this is the paint scheme I'm going to be using for their infantry of the line models, so to speak, not my character models. I've decided on a different scheme for them. Alright, so let's dive right in. As you can see, I've got my wet palette, I've got my brushes, paints, models, and a pen and paper for taking notes about how I'm doing this paint job, since I want to definitely be able to reproduce it. It is, after all, the paint scheme for my ladies of the line, so to speak, my average foot soldier. This will be the color scheme they get. Okay, so going straight in, I'm going to start with my scorched brown base coat, and this is going to give me a nice really dark, ruddy brown color to work from for my metallic. The reason I want to do that is the dark, opaque color will spread nice and smooth and it'll make it easier to get a good first coat for my metallic paint. Metallics can sometimes be hard to work with, especially as your first base coat, because they can be kind of thick and gloopy because of the metallic flake in them. So that's why I like to start with a different base coat to kind of set the tone. I already know I want this to be like a bronzish kind of gold, so I definitely want to go with the dark reddish base coat. Now that we've got the paint shows, we're going to just go ahead and dive right into actually applying it. There I've got my model on my paint handle, which is just an empty craft paint bottle filled up with hobby sand from the dollar store, so it's nice and cheap, but it gives me something solid to hold on to besides the model, and I found that that actually is a lot more comfortable in general. Now, as I'm doing the base coat, I'm just kind of glooping the paint on with the biggest brush I can and then spreading it out to where it's a nice thin coat. The reason I do that is the larger brush lets me to apply the base coat a lot faster. It's not as accurate necessarily, but since this is the first color, it kind of gives me a good starting point. Now, I did screw up here and I kind of painted a little bit of that brown onto the skirt. That was a mistake, probably shouldn't have done that, and I won't be doing it in the future. I'm just going to be painting straight over the green. But that's okay, it'll turn out alright for this model. I think it did kind of impede my uh, green a little bit. I had to put on a couple extra coats for my base coat on my green, but that'll, that'll turn out okay. And here, I'm just going through nice and slow, applying my base coat and taking my time, because I want it to be nice and thin. I'm making sure I'm leaving as little primer showing as possible. So I'm going to be speeding up a bunch of this footage because playing the video straight through would make this a very very long video and it's already pretty lengthy. So here I just go through and I finish base coating the rest of the model in this scorched brown and I make sure like I said to just get the entire model, give it a nice smooth coat and just make it a nice opaque coat that doesn't show any primer through it. And that's my base coat for the brown. Next, we're going to get straight to work painting the first layer of bronze onto the model. I've just glooped that out there onto my wet palette and going to water it down a little bit so it's a nice thin coat on the first try. This is pretty much just like the base coat and you just kind of layer it on nice and thin and make sure you get in all the crevices, or at least mostly. It's not a big deal if you don't. You won't really be able to see it if you miss any of the really deep details. The wash that'll go on over it'll help hide some of that, as well as the brown-red undertone will also help hide some of those mistakes if you miss anything. Here, we're just going to get started, get a little bit of paint on the brush, make sure it's at the consistency we want. There was a little too thick still, so I'm mixing it around on my wet palette to make sure that I get it thinned down with some of the water that's on there. Once I get it down to where I want it, there I'm drawing it out to make sure it's not breaking and it's not past the point where it's too watery. And there I pull my brush out to a fine point with my thumbnail. And there we just get started. Sorry it's off camera there a little bit. I'm still getting used to this, although I think I'm getting better. It's just a little time consuming. It's also a little out of focus, but I think that's also because it's not centered in the shot the way I wanted it to be. I do apologize for that, and hopefully I continue to improve. Now, there's nothing really magical about any particular process I use here or any techniques I use. It's basically just the standard painting method for miniatures, which is 
base coat on top of a primer and then a thin layer paint on top of that then a wash over it to kind of blend it together and shade it and then some highlighting on top of that to kind of make everything look a little bit sharper and pop a little um, in this coat i also did a couple other steps i went back and did some touch up and i did some edge highlighting later on but those are still also very basic concepts this paint scheme really isn't terribly difficult to achieve uh, apparently framing this shot is though, so I do apologize again. But really the keys for me achieving the end results I do is just patience and taking my time and going back and fixing my mistakes. Really that's the best way for me to get the results I want. I don't have a particularly steady hand. I shake a lot. I have arthritis from industrial construction I used to do. So I'm not exactly prime for this. It's it's really something I have to work at to get good results. But the point is, if I can do it with all these hang-ups and issues I have with getting good results, anybody can do it. And anybody could probably be better at it than I am just taking your time, learning all the various more advanced techniques that I don't know. Really, this is just to show my process and how I do it to achieve a good result. If you're a more advanced painter, I am positive you can find much better painting teachers and tutorials out there on YouTube and in other parts of the internet. Of course, I'd have to recommend that you start with my personal favorite painting tutorial maker, and that is Scotty the Miniac. If you haven't seen that guy's work, it's fantastic. And one of my favorite parts about his channel is that he doesn't just do advanced techniques. He does techniques that cover basically all the different parts of painting from very beginner level stuff all the way through the more advanced stuff like wet blending and crazy OSL stuff that I have no hope of ever being that great at. Now as you can see I've moved things around a little bit and gotten set up. My bronze coat is pretty much entirely done with the first layer and now I'm getting ready to start in on my green. So I chose for my base coat and the primary color I want this to be is old school citadel dark angels green um i know they have other colors that are named similarly now but i'm pretty sure dark angels green now is a contrast paint this is definitely not that this is the old school heavily pigmented standard games workshop paint i know you can find color equivalents i'm gonna see if i can find a uh, color chart that i have saved somewhere that's basically a conversion chart for different paint ranges so you can find similar colors in different ranges. Everybody has a different preference on their choice of paint. And my personal favorite is Army Painter. Some of the other favorite ranges people have are of course the Citadel Games Workshop paints, uh, Vallejo, and um, Model 75. Those are the ones that jump out at me as I think about it. So here you can see I'm just doing the same thing I did with the brown. I'm starting in with a nice evenly distributed layer of the Dark Force Green. Now this takes a couple coats because of the color I chose for my primer. And I want it to be a dark green so I really have to slather that on there in a couple coats. Now you want to do it in a couple coats instead of just going in for one thick coat. And the reasoning behind that is you want to be able to make sure you get it applied nice and smooth. Otherwise, things later on will start to look bad. So as I'm cleaning up, I'm taking a minute here. I kind of got a little overzealous as I was doing the green base coat. So I'm kind of breaking my own rules here and cleaning up before I go any further. And that's because I messed up my layer of bronze on one of the areas where there's like a slit up the side of the skirt tabard tacit thing. So I'm just going in and I'm being really careful and I'm going to clean up some of the details that I messed up. And this is like I was saying earlier, one of my tricks to success is just take your time, clean up your messes, fix any problems that you create for yourself and just be patient. Painting like this is not a quick process. So here, like I said, I'm just going to continue touch up a little bit of the paint. Normally, I do this in between every layer. Here, I guess I decided I was finishing the base coat of the green, so I might as well touch up where I screwed up the bronze. And I'm just going to continue cleaning up and move on to the next step. Once I've got that tidied up and I'm happy with it, I move on to doing a second coat of green on the skirts because I want it to be 
a really rich, really deep forest green. And I'm just going to move right along, use a little bit more cleanup, frame it in a little better, make sure that coat's nice and smooth. And I'm just going to take my time getting it all in there. And yeah, just finishing up, smoothing it all out, cleaning up there around the back side of the armor, making sure that I get down into the recesses of the folds of the skirts, and just being nice and careful with it. Get the underside a little bit there. Make sure that no matter what angle you look at the model from, there's no primer showing. And that it's all one uniform color. Let's take a second and talk about one of the best pieces of advice I can give for writing, and that's to write it all down. I write down the exact paints I use, how many coats I use, uh, what order I did them in, and the reason I do that is it makes it a lot easier to reproduce your paint job. When you're just doing one squad, it's not such a big deal, but as you add models to your army, if you're doing a big army, or if you get other characters you want to add, it helps to know exactly what you did. And with that, let's go ahead and move back onto the actual painting. Next up, we're going to start shading the model, and I'm going to start by shading the green of the skirt. I'm going to use Games Workshop Citadel's Argothian, Earth, or Argothian Camo Shade, I believe it's called. And once I get that shaken up and opened up, it's going to start... This is one of the few paints that you just apply straight from the pot. Any kind of wash, generally, it's safe to apply just straight out of the pot. This is also the only kind of paint where you really just kind of literally slather it on there, coat everything with it. It's okay if it pools a little, if that's the effect you're going for. But here, like I said, you just make sure it gets down into the crevices and just paint it on there nice and thick. And just go over the entire section of the model you want shaded with this. Now what this does is, like I said, it works its way down into the crevices, into the low-lying points on the model. In this case, it worked down into the folds and creases in the cloth to really highlight those, or shadow them rather, to show them off and give the model a little more depth. And just be careful, take your time. You don't want to, in this case, since there's multiple colors and I'm doing them different shades, I don't want to spill over too much. Um, getting this on other parts of the model will stain it, even if it's only there for a second. You have a little bit of working time, but it's not really that fast. It's not as forgiving as some paint is. All right, next I'm just going to flip the model over, get the wash in underneath it, make sure that area is nice and dark. I don't want any of the primer showing. I don't want to have any excess color showing down there. I just want it to be dark and shadowy, but I still want it to be in the same hue that the rest of the that area of the model is, the dark, dark green. Now I've given that time to dry, and as you can see, it dries with a really, really glossy finish, which we don't want. But that's okay, we're going to end up dry brushing over that, and then at the very end, the model's going to get a spray of matte varnish to kind of cover up all those sorts of things. It also helps blend the model together a little bit better as far as the color quality. So here, I'm just going to get out my paint choice, which I'm using uh, Warp Stone, I believe, from Citadel. And I'm going to just kind of color match a little bit. I want to make sure I'm in the same general palette. I don't want it to be too yellow, and I don't want it to be too blue. I want it to stay that nice, natural green. So here, uh, you'll see I'm actually using a makeup brush. Just a cheap dollar store used makeup brush will do. And you just get your paint on there. And then you take a paper towel, and you wipe most of your paint right back off until you're almost seeing no paint come off of the brush as you're going. And once you've got that done, and you're satisfied that most of the pigment's off your brush, you just kind of brush across the high raised edges. And what this will do is it'll pick out all of the details that have those raised spots, like the higher spots on the model. Now I'm being a little messy with this, which means I'm going to have to go back and do some cleanup work on the brass bronze color later, but that'll be okay. So after applying the Warp Stone Glow, I still wasn't quite happy with my color. I wanted to brighten up the highlights a little more and really add some more depth to the model. So here I've got out, I believe, Goblin Green from Army Painters Range, and an old beat-up brush that the bristles don't quite lay the way they're supposed to. 
Older brushes like that that have seen some wear are also great for dry brushing because it doesn't really matter if the point's fine or not. And this, I'm just being a little more focused, hence I'm also using a smaller brush for a little bit more fine accuracy. And I'm just going back over the areas that I really want to pronounce and have show up for the highlights. And so I'm just going to apply this second lighter layer of dry brushing and let that bring out some more of the detail in the cloth. And now that I'm satisfied with that, I'm pretty happy with the green color I got out of it. I'm going to move on and I'm going to start shading the bronze part of the armor. So here I'm using Citadel Game Workshop's Null Oil for metallics and that sort of stuff. This, this stuff is like magic. It really it shades everything. It gives it a nice finish. It tones down the like the brilliance of the metals to really make them look like they're forged and it's not just all one piece of resin. It, it just does so much. It gives it the right oily kind of appearance almost. So it really, this, this wash, in some cases I'm very for using other things like other companies' washes, but for this one, it's really hard to replace an oil. As you can see, I'm just applying that very liberally. I want to make sure it gets into every crevice, every nook and cranny, and I want it over the entire model. In some cases, you want to do almost like from the Gundam world, like panel lining or, you know, that kind of where you just apply the wash into the crevices or into the panel lines. In this case, though, I'm trying to darken down that almost brassy color. So I'm just applying this very liberal over the whole thing. And that'll darken it all down. It'll give it that kind of metallic oiliness. And it'll really just shade the entire thing down a couple notches to where I want it. One of the downsides of relying on washes this heavily is it takes a little while to let them dry unlike the rest of the painting process. But here you can see the finished product and that's dried, darkened up all of the recesses, really kind of brought out some of the high points in the shading and just kind of toned down that color a lot which is exactly what we wanted, so that looks pretty good. But now we gotta bring that color back up a little bit. So at this stage, we're gonna go back over it with a liberal layer of the same original brass color or bronze color to bring that back up a little bit and bring out some of the higher details. And I'm just gonna go over this. I'm generally gonna use downward strokes because I'm trying to highlight the high edges. And I'm trying to leave the low lights, like the shadows, where they're at and where the light would hit them, or where the light wouldn't hit them, rather. So I want to focus on the high areas and leave the lower recessed areas mostly alone. And here, as you can see, that really helped to bring out the detail and bring a little bit of that metallic sheen back to the model. I'm just going to touch up a few areas where the non oil really pulled a little bit too much, more than I was happy with. And then we're going to move on and get ready to do the more delicate highlighting. And here we can see she's starting to look pretty good. The green with the bronze colors are really popping. I really like that. And we're gonna start to bring up a little bit more of the upper highlights by mixing a little bit of gunmetal into our bronze color. So I used roughly two parts bronze to one part gunmetal, just to add that little bit of shimmery silver to the bronze. And I'm gonna use a much nicer fine point brush for this because I wanna be very careful to only apply this exactly where I want it. And of course, I'm going to be using my wet palette for this while I'm mixing paints, and this has a couple of advantages. One, um, I can save the paint after I've mixed it, at least for a little while. It'll stay a little bit damp and workable while it's on the palette, and that's because the water seeps through the um, parchment paper and keeps the paint uh, saturated. This also lets me mix the two bottles, uh, the two dropper bottles paints together a lot easier to get a better idea of what I want. With the white uh, parchment paper, it lets me figure out exactly the color I want and lets me work out the consistency I need. So the wet palette, especially when you're gonna be mixing paints or blending, doing a lot of heavy blending, is a really, really useful tool. 
I just have a homemade one that includes a water pot, but I'll include the link to both the brush that I'm using and to a professional wet palette in the description below. Okay, so I'm repointing my brush, got my point back nice and fine, so it'll be good for doing this part of the highlighting. Just gonna pick up a little paint on the brush, and now this, you wanna get the belly of the brush full, but you don't wanna have any excess on there. And now I'm just gonna use the side of the brush more than the tip, and I'm gonna run it along the edges that I wanna highlight, and this'll just catch the very highest points of the model to bring out those extra details and give it that little bit of extra glint and flash. Because this is all about bringing out more depth in the model. The wash and the shading gave it a lot of shadow, made it darkened down. Now we're trying to bring it back to life and bring out those really high spots. And you want to be careful while you're doing this. Just focus on those high spots, like I said. Take your time. This is a, sort of an extra step you don't really need to take. It's just an extra one that I enjoy because I like bringing out that extra bit of detail in the models. Okay, now that I've finished the highlighting, I'm going to move on. And I'm going to add in some depth back into that faceplate by going in and painting the eye slits. Now I've sort of decided these are going to be relatively low tech. They're not going to have any like lenses or anything. So this is just going to be a plain black slit where the eye should be. And I'm just going to go in with my fine tipped brush there. Very carefully fill in that gap between the helmet and the visor where the eye slits are being very careful trying not to get any on the rest of the helmet it's kind of inevitable inevitable though but you can always go back in and clean that up here in a minute like we're going to taking a closer look at the model that we've got now i'm pretty happy with those results there's a little cleanup that needs done still but so far so good i really like the color scheme i like the way the model's turning out more so than i thought i would at first green's a color i don't paint very often so i wasn't terribly confident in the color selection, but overall I'm very pleased with it. And the next thing we're going to do is go in and clean things up a little bit. So here we're just going to go in and anywhere where we got a little carried away with the other colors and the shading needs touched up a little bit, we're just going to go back in with the same base coat of bronze we had. Just paint over any of those mistakes. This is where the extra effort really comes into play and lets you hide all of those little errors you made through the rest of the process. And believe it or not, that's the key to success. If you make mistakes, it's okay to go back in later and hide them. Or as Adam Savage put it in one of his videos on Tested, I believe he referred to it as hiding the bodies. So here I'm going to continue doing exactly that. Uh, after taking another look at the model, I decided some of the lower parts of the model were still too dark, especially on the bronze, so I'm just going to go back in and touch that up and brighten those areas back up a little bit more. And this time we're just going to be really careful and go in and be very precise. We're going to try not to get into any of the other colors at all. The point of this is to brighten up the bronze and nothing else. This is kind of already at the point where we're correcting previous mistakes and we're going to try really hard not to make any new ones. And just go through, got the video fast forwarded because this took a little bit. And just go through and touch up all the green where I wasn't satisfied with it and all the bronze. Just being careful to keep them separate and block everything in exactly how I want it. And this is the stage where you really want to take your time, be careful, clean up any issues you've created for yourself previously, and just real carefully neaten everything up. Now as you can see the model's more or less finished. I've just got a couple little extra things I want to do to it before I call it done. I decided this was just a little bit drab with just the two-tone, so I decided I was going to go in and on both models because I did a white one as well that's going to be part of the same force. I decided I wanted to tie both the armor schemes together 
by painting the fleur-de-lis on both models uh, a bright brass color instead of the darker bronze. So here I've just got some on my wet palette and I'm working up to it and just gonna go in and the chest piece has the fleur-de-lis right there in the middle of it and I'm just gonna paint a nice coat of the brass right over top of it. And with the brass finished we're pretty much done with the model. So I'd like to thank everybody that's watched the video this long. I know this isn't the most in-depth painting tutorial of all time or especially not the best paint job ever but I'm pretty proud of it and it should be good for beginners and people that are just curious about the paint scheme and how I achieved the end results I got. I'd also like to take the chance to go through the basics uh, always included in these sorts of videos. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you want to see more, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to be sure to catch everything we do on Clock Tower Game Studios, be sure to hit the notification bell. And if you really like what we do, you can always choose to support us by picking up some of the materials you saw in the video here uh, by shopping at the Amazon affiliate links in the description below. You can also find links down there for our Patreon page. And if you really like the models, which I have to admit are gorgeous, uh, you can check out Anvil Industries website. They'll be listed in the description below as well. That being said, this wasn't a sponsored video. It is in, not a paid promotion of any sort. Anvil Industries is where I'm making the video, but other than that, they're not involved in any way, and all opinions expressed are my own. Next time, we're going to actually go through a more in-depth overview of the game Seer and go through and explain all the details about it because I've got a playtest game coming up and I'm excited for that and I'm going to take the opportunity to write a list using these uh, Daughters of the Burning Rose. So the next one will be the Seer overview and the following video will be a list writing tutorial, basically the how-to of going through and writing a list to play the game with. So while there will be more content uh, revolving around the Anvil Industries models, we're also going to be moving on to actually talking and discussing Seer in more detail, and I'm really looking forward to that. So remember, at the clock tower, it's always game time. <laughs>